you know, for me, what I started doing was I, I would use the team, you know, I wouldn't call them a team because we're not under one umbrella, but I would say, yeah, me and my partners, because at that point I was, I would legitimately, I had people that I was talking to and I was, we were telling each other, yeah, let's go find a deal. You know, mm-hmm. I wouldn't say me and my partners, if you legitimately are not working with anybody, yeah. <laughs> but if, if there's one person that you're working with, that's either going to bring capital to the table or they're going to do the asset management or whatever they're underwriting deals with you. Even if you don't have a deal they're they're in my book, they're partners, yeah, you know, you're, you're, you're team, working yeah, together. That's true. And so I use that a lot on broker calls. I say, yeah, me and my partners were looking in, in this area and so on. And in the beginning, I always got the question, well, where are they? What's your, what's your response that, you know, brokers are, are prickly sometimes when you first get to know them. Um, but it did help to have the knowledge that it wasn't just some person, a singular entity roaming about the internet, finding properties. It makes a big difference to know that you already have people in your corner and, um, and, you know, certain people are responsible to raise the capital. You're responsible to do whatever you're doing and so on. You know, it gives you a lot. I, I find it gives you a lot more confidence, right? Cause you, you know, so when you get asked, well, you know, who does the ask measure? they can't really ask you those questions. You don't, if you say, hey, I'm the money raiser, well, you know what? You've got an instant, you know, out. Well, I don't do that part of the business. I'd love to help you, Mr. Broker, but I don't, I don't handle that part of it, right? And then, you know, that's what I've kind of found that you can just stay focused on one, you know, and say, hey, I, that's, that's my other partner. Yeah. It, it wasn't asked yet. If someone else has a question, please interrupt yeah, me. Yeah, if somebody um, else but, we don't need to take up the time here. <laughs> but yeah, in the absence of a question, Daryl, when you spoke up, it reminded me of something because I think we've talked about it before, Daryl, but, you know, on the investor side of things, you know, I mentioned in our underwriting and I didn't get to go through all of the, you know, where we added a bit of conservatism, why we added buffer here. I call it buffer. Yeah. In my world, you know, why we add, you could say why we mitigated certain risks. If there you, you will. go. Yeah. There you go. So, you know, we didn't get into all the, the mitigations that we put into that underwriting, but I think as a, as an investor, it, it's a, you know, and I'm, I'm speaking on the passive side, even the active side, because if you're going to partner with someone, I mean, you need to know how to look at their underwriting and figure out if, if they're blowing smoke, for lack of a better word. But, mm-hmm. you know, you need to, to look at it with that cautious mindset of, can they really do what they're saying they're going to do? Um, and I've seen some opportunities come across my desk for, you know, partnerships or, hey, we've got this deal. What do you think? Kind of kind of exchanges. Um and, you know, I would encourage even the passive investor, get into a little bit of underwriting, especially right now. Um, deals are hard to come by. And it's, um, you know, it's sometimes you find different practices that may not align. That's probably the polite way of saying that. But sometimes you find different practices that may not align with your comfort level of how to mitigate risks. Yeah. Um, and, you know, one example is the market. Does the market really support the rent that you're going to ask? You know, just because there's five properties within a 25 mile radius that are getting hundred dollars more a month is the street that it's on <laughs> yeah. and the demographic that, it, that this property is attracting. Is that going to, is that going to, you know, be able to support that kind of rent bump? You know, you could have a property across town, do whatever it wants. But is that area where it's located really going to perform? And there's a lot of those kind of things that, you know, I've seen recently pop up and some of it, you know, whether it's intentional or not, you know, I can't say, but it does draw a lot of question to even on the passive side for people looking on that side or even the active investors that may not be so strong in the underwriting. Um, you know, there's, there's those things that you can legitimately look at and anyone can you know, can pull up, you know, some rent comps and figure out, hey, you know, is it reasonable what's being said? Because just because it's written down doesn't necessarily mean it's reasonable. And I see that being a lot of um, goodness in there um, that comes with practice, right? As you get more familiar with the market, as you get more familiar with, well, what should expenses be, you know? 
Well, so what you're saying, Brady, is don't take word for word what the broker's OM says <laughs> as that's what the property is going to do, right? Is that what you're trying to tell me? <laughs> well, for the brokers, yes, and for the underwriter. So yeah. I was speaking also and primarily about the if, if it's not your deal, if you haven't done the underwriting on it, um, you know, there's, you know, be at least be aware as much as you can, you know, because I, I mean, I know, you know, fortunately, or, you know, some brokers are quite open, <laughs> you know, now with, you know, discussing and I mean, there's deals that are getting closed that even, you know, the, these brokers see a lot of properties and I've, I've had, you know, a few over the last few weeks tell me, I don't know how they're going to make any money <laughs> on, the, <laughs> on the property, but they're going to buy it, you know? <laughs> so yeah, um, and that's from the broker's perspective. So, um, you know, a good bit of, you know, knowledge about the market that you're looking to invest in goes a really long way. Um, you know, so that, that that's just, it was reminded me of it because Daryl and I were talking about markets a while back, I think. So. That's good. That's yeah. good advice. That's good advice. Anybody got any other questions? Yeah, I have a quick question, uh, sure. Brady. Even uh, I was thinking about um, whether you can learn much about doing a lot of multifamily real investing as an LP on a major project, as opposed to uh, you know jumping in to being a GP on your first project. Um, or do you find that it's quite passive and you don't actually see a lot of what happens behind the scenes on some of these uh, projects if you if you just join as an LP? Um, I think it depends on the project you get in on. If you get in on, you know, like a major, um, you know, uh, apartment building and, you know, you're, they're, they're raising, you know, $5 million and you're bringing in, you know, 50k <laughs> and they don't know your name that's different than and you'll still learn something from that don't get me wrong but that's different than kind of coming along someone that you do know um that you've built a network with and they happen to find a property before you um so that's what i did is i i ended up partnering with someone that i knew from just my networking uh, they found a property they were going to close on it uh, they still needed to raise some money. And I was like, okay, I'm going to partner with y'all. Now, granted, I don't, out of that, I'm not getting that, that high level experience that I would get, say for a, a bigger property, more experienced sponsor. Um, but because I know them, it does give me a, uh, a closer connection to kind of behind the scenes. Um, and, you know, I, I think you, you've probably got to answer, is it worth it to do that first? Um, it, I think investing as a passive investor in real estate is, is an awesome way to grow wealth. <laughs> and I think, you know, for some people um, it's the right way to do it, to be honest. I, you know, being an active GP isn't, you know, the end all, right. Um, certainly not. I mean, our, our goal, everyone's goal should be on the passive side, not the active <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's honest. true that's true <laughs> well too also now, another thing is too is you could there's different thing you want to learn on which side of passive you can get the background the back you know pull the curtain back and see what how a syndication works before you actually have to go out and do it right so you know the tools they use or don't use and how you would improve it so when you offer it to your people as a gp that's what I learned to do it is kind of say, okay, I'm going to take notes, you know, and that's what I went into it with, right? I, okay. What, how, what do they use? How do they present? What do they show at the things? Those kind of stuff you can do. Obviously that's, you're paying for that, right? But you're also paying for a coach. You're also paying to go to, 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 you know, seminars and stuff. It's just another seminar. Now it was a great question, James. I mean, that's just depending yeah. on what you, you'll, you will get something out of it. Not only will you earn money, but you'll, you'll learn the, the back end of the process as well. Yeah. And there is some value, James, in knowing that that gap between when someone gets something under contract to closing, you know, and just if you know the people that you're investing with and you can kind of get that behind the scenes look or even regular updates, you know, mm -hmm. closes a lot of 
you know, if, if you're, if, if you get something under contract and you're looking forward into this black hole of, <laughs> of uncertainty, that's a lot different than, Hey, I was a passive investor on this deal and this is what they did. You know, even closing that gap is, there's a lot of value there. Um, you know, so yeah, I, I would say there's definitely value on the front end. If, if you, you know, can get that kind of update on what, what they're going through and so on, if you know the people, or even if you don't, you at least get some, advantage from it and say hey Brady um Brady would you also say that some sponsors uh don't mind teaching so so for James if he was with a sponsor that was in a teaching mode that it would benefit him so that whenever he does make that change to go into a GP that he's even more equipped so would would you say that some sponsors are in the teaching mode and some are not yeah yeah i'm um i don't have anyone that i'm closely tied to like that but i do know of some other sponsors out there that i mean they they make it their mission to educate their their passive investors on what's going on you know um you know not just as a as a happenstance of you know regular email updates but as a purposeful education about hey you know we want you to to understand you know so yeah i think it's finding those those right connections and that's why i say it probably depends you know james on your question on who you're you're really coming in as as a passive investor with and and are they you know planning to do that you know i think i think someone that has a few properties under their belts much more likely to do that than someone that has you know you know, a thousand, six thousand units. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But, you know, it's all, I, I go back to it's to me, it's all about the relationships and, and building those relationships, you know, and sitting across the table from someone and treating them like a person, you know, whether they're a broker, an investor, a GP, you know, and, and through that, you'll find the connections you need to learn what you need to learn. Very good. Very good. Goodness. Awesome. Any other questions, comments? Can we go over the um, financial sheet that was up on the screen previously so I can get an understanding of uh, yeah. the numbers? It would help me as an investor. Sure. Sure. Um, was it this one? Where is the, the 200 grand coming from? Is it the second mortgage at 140 and where's the other 60 coming from? So, yeah, so that, that's a good question on here. So if we go kind of top to bottom, this is what they wanted, the asking price. Here's where we got it. It's price per unit, earnest money deposit. That's what we put up to, you know, at, at uh, when, when we signed the contract with them, yeah, with the, the seller. Uh, you put this earnest money down and then the down payment is on the loan. And then it shows two loans here. Yeah. Uh, so the total loan amount was 1.4 million and change. Um, this second mortgage here is for the capital improvement. Yeah. But okay. it's only, it's, yeah. it's under that. Go ahead. Well, no, I see repairs at 200 and then the second for 140. Where's the other 60 K come from? I mean, yeah, 60 K. Where's that come from? So we raised that money. So this 140 is the bank uh, is loaning us that money and that covers 140 of the 200. Yeah. And if you come further down, you have your closing costs, acquisition fees. Yep. This is the total repair cost, right? Um, some operating reserves. And then this total member capital needed to close is all of that combined. Yeah. So whatever's not on the loan. Um, but is needed to either cover closing costs, acquisition fee, uh, or repairs, or operating reserves. That's this number. Yeah. And then who? Uh, uh, and then the investors uh, off of the seven seventy four. Your member equity and uh, manager equity um, uh, is part of that. So, so yeah, so we'll just round it off. So 775,000 yep. is the total amount of capital that we had to raise. Yep. And 
out of that is, you know, the, the, so to, to make it simple, <laughs> I wish I had a dry erase board. <laughs> 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 to, to make it simple, the, the member equity at 75% is, you know, we're assuming that member equity, uh, that's the passive investor. Yeah. And the, the way that this is set up is that that 775 is all being raised from that bucket, the LP, the limited partner side, if you will. I see. So the now, 75% is the 774. That's what the investor, uh, the, oh, I see, we would I call see passive investor would put in. So let me, I, I understand what you're saying. So we have to raise the total amount of 775,000 and the percentage of that number. So let's say I raised a hundred, let's say I put in a hundred percent of that amount. I, you know, I put in the full 775,000 as a, uh, as a passive investor. Then what I would get in my pocket is 75% of the quarterly income distributions. Yeah. And 75% of the equity when we go to sell the property, I would get all of that. I see. And then the managers would get 25% of the rest. Yeah. Got it. That's how you look at it. So if you're bringing in 50,000 of this 775,000, then you would get a proportional amount of that. Does that make sense? Yes, it does. Now, does and it? So this is a, a bit of a breakdown of that, if you will, um, showing how 50,000 would break out from the total capital. Now, uh, what is the normal uh, uh, period that these uh, uh, deals go? This one is showing seven years. I've heard mm -hmm. of with opportunity zones, 10 years. Uh, I've never invested in multifamily and I'm just trying to get a, an overview. What is the normal? Is the normal five years, four years, seven years, 10 years? Oh, that's a good question. I I think it depends. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it, 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 it's, it, it has been five to seven years, typical in a syndication in our groups here. Um, but with COVID, people are extending it seven years because of the unknown. But it just depends, Buck, on, on which group you go with. Uh, you know, I know some groups that they, they do, you know, seven to 10, and that's, they don't do anything less. So it just it just varies depending on the asset, depending on the returns, you know, and, and, and their strategy and their business strategy. It really does. So here's my uh, problem uh, in that I'm a, I'm a mature uh, person who's retired and uh, I, I don't want a 10 year return because I could be dead by then. You know what I'm saying? So mm -hmm. I'm more into the, you know, the four year, the five year and uh, Brady who decides now, is it the seven year, you said you're going to look at it after three years, four years, who, who makes the final decision on when to sell? Yeah, so that would be the general partnership makes that final decision. So, but you know up front kind of what the business plan is. Yeah, I mean, everyone is, when you get, so for us, I mentioned this was our investor packet, you know. So when we're, when we're ready to raise capital or when we're ready to close on a deal, right? We've done enough due diligence that we know, okay, we're going to bring this to investors and bring it to close and not walk away from it. So we're going to bring it forward. You know, by that point, the investors that, you know, are, are out there will know, this is the general outline of what we're expecting. You know, they'll know, hey, we plan to hold it for five years. We plan returns to be at this number. We need to raise this much capital. They're not going to know all the details, but they'll get an upfront look. So as a passive investor, even before, you know, the first kind of investor webinar, most people are going to send out kind of a, an informational email about, hey, here's some general idea of what we're doing and where this property is going to be. Um, and there's a, most people that I see, Buck, are looking at five years. Um, and with the expectation that if the market's really good, like it is right now, <laughs> that they're going to shorten it. Yeah. I think the only reason people would lengthen it is if you're just at the bottom of a cycle. 
and which makes no sense for the investor or the general partnership to sell, right? Um, if you have something like what happened in 2008, 2009, you know, and you're, and you're making a profit, it's definitely not the time to sell, right? Um, you want to wait that out. And that, to me, would be, you know, that, that's why people would wait at the end of the day. Um, well, in the real but, world, do, do the managers, let's say our managers are running the show here and uh, they have another deal on the back burner with some other deal. Is it possible that that they could actually sell because they have another deal and they want to cash out? Is that a possibility? Does that ever happen in the real world? I'm PP. sure it does. <laughs> I, yeah, I've never had that happen. I mean, okay, you know, I'm asking. Each, yeah, each, each deal stands on its own. Um, yeah. The reason they would sell a deal early, and again, this is just for us and not for Brady, but, you know, it would be that we've met the business plan way ahead of schedule, right? If, we, if this is mm -hmm. what we're projecting and the, they just bought this in March and somebody comes to them at the end of this year and offers them exactly what they were looking for in seven years, you'd be really a, a fool not to take it, right? I so. Think. That, that's that's really so if the business plan is met and we can get this person to the closing field yeah we're going to yeah. sell that thing you know right away because i've just shortened your time frame right i'm going to give you what we told you we're going to give you in seven years or five years i'm going to give it to, it to you in two years, years. Yeah. you know yeah and that's what i was going to say i think in the end but i don't know i i don't have a tremendous amount of experience obviously but the, the people that i know the reason they sell early is because they've met the business plan. I mean, generally speaking, people are going to try and hit their business plan, right? Otherwise, their reputation is not going to go very far. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And, yeah, I mean, people but, aren't. Um, Pat, would you also uh, say that um, in reference to what Buck is asking, uh, um, his questions can, can be answered in the PPM because the PPM is going to put in detail what the plan is, how long they plan on holding it. If they're able to hit their goal ahead of time, they are going to disposition that property so that all the investors will receive 100% of their principal plus the proceeds. So would you say that he could he, that, that information can also be found in the PPM? Yes, yeah. And that, and that the PPM is the private placement memorandum for people who don't know. And that's the let's say the good, bad, and ugly of an investment. You know, that's all the small print. But yes, it spells out exactly, hey, if we hit it here, we can sell. If we do this, we can sell. And that would, Buck, for you would be that for everybody, would, would spell out exactly the ways uh, that this won't go the duration of the business plan, right? If we run into this, this happens. So it's usually dictated out in there. That's good. Thank you, Daryl. I appreciate it. I forgot about that. That's that's a great way. And that and that that is what you get after you say, okay, I'm in. You give a soft commit to this project. And then you would get that PPM back from the, the GPs and you sign that document and say, okay, yep, I understand. Here's all the and the PPM is is basically a lot of it's just, you know, worst case scenario. You know, if this happens, that happens. But again, they want you to be aware of worst case, right? So when you're signing up, this is what is going to happen. Yeah. Yeah, the PPM is meant to scare you and inform you. Yes, at the same time. <laughs> <laughs> and it, it does a good job of both. But yeah. Yeah. Does, does that answer your question, Buck? And that's a very good question. You had some very good questions. No, no, I just want to know the numbers. I'm a numbers guy. Just want to understand. That's it. No, that's good. That's that's good. Mm -hmm. I'm glad you're asking. That's that's what we're looking for here. Yeah. And yeah, I think, think this here, what this is a the, the profit and loss, uh, right for the for the property, mm -hmm. going out seven years, right? Yeah, yeah. So this is the profit and loss. This is the pro forma, if you will, going out seven years of kind of the projection of how much income are we projecting, how much expenses are we projecting. Um, it's, of course, tied to your capital improvement plan. You know, when are you planning to finish that? For us, we're, I mentioned it earlier, it's a, it's a bit extended. 
uh, for us because we're going to finish our capital improvements in the first year. Um, but we extended the um, the uh, improvement in uh, rents uh, by three years. Yeah, I mentioned that earlier. Normally, it'd be closer. You know, the bump in in rent would be closer to the finishing of the capital improvement. For us, it was a mitigation to push it out because of COVID. But typically, you would see that bump in rent closely tied to, you know, maybe the year after you finish most of your capital improvements. Um, you know, the other thing I think on the underwriting side that I encourage, uh, you know, passive investors to look at is also, you know, we, we talk about this term called um, um, the cap rate, right? Which is just the capitalization rate, which is if you look at how much you bought something for, versus the NOI, it's that ratio, right? Um, and it's, you know, especially these days where your interest rates are super low. Yeah, not to go into super detail, but your interest rates are really low for, for loans, um, which also is allowing people to push these capitalization rates really low. Yeah, so they're, they're paying, in other words, they're paying a lot more money for the same net operating income compared to a few years ago. Yeah, um, your guess is as good as mine is if that's sustainable and what happens if uh, or when I should say interest rates on loans start to creep up over the next few years, because inevitably that ratio between what you're going to get for leverage and what the capitalization rate is for the market are closely or somehow closely tied together. Yeah, um, they're at least influenced by each other. Right. And so. I would encourage you look to make sure people are increasing that capitalization rate over time. If it's 5.5% today and they're underwriting, have they creeped it up to, you know, 6% or 6.5% over time? Um, because that is one of the biggest drivers in your prediction on when you sell the property as to where you think the market is when you sell, you know? So in the numbers, um, you'll see it, um, well, this is just an example uh, of cap rates, but in the actual underwriting, um, when we go to sell, um, the way that it may not be shown in this example, but in general, it starts with the current market cap and then increments at uh, a tenth of a percent point over time. But, you know, maybe that's too far in the weeds, but at the same time, as a passive investor, you know, understanding what is the biggest driver for the number that I'm seeing on my return, it may be the cap rate. And understanding how the person has underwritten that and are they assuming it doesn't change, that's probably a, too big of a risk for me personally. Yeah, it may not be for you. It, you know, everybody's got to make that judgment, but it is a significant driver on the back end assumption of how much equity you're going to get out of the property. You know, if that makes any sense. Yeah. Oh, that does. And thank you for sharing that. That's uh, very good information to, to know that and get the inside, you know, scope of this. So you can, as a passive or a GP, understand what you're getting into. Yeah. Awesome. Did anybody else have any questions on the numbers or any, anything actually, but these, uh, that we have the numbers up here. Harrison just drew on my numbers. <laughs> <laughs> somebody didn't like something there. Did somebody have a question where they were trying to circle something? <laughs> Here, let's see if it'll let me clear it. There we go. Okay. All righty. Yeah. Well, listen, cool. this is, uh, Brady, uh, this has been fantastic. Uh, thank you very much for an hour and a half. I, I thank you very much. I appreciate that. I appreciate you spending an hour and a half with us. It's been very, very entertaining. Um, and make sure that uh, that you put your information in the chat, folks. Um, and, you know, thank you very much, Brady, for coming on. And, and, and I learned a few things, uh, which I always love doing. And I appreciate you coming on and spending your night with us. I know you have family. So, I'll cut it off at an hour and a half. I appreciate that. Um, and uh, like I said, put your information in the chat. We'll get that chat log uh, to you when I get the recording out. Um, and uh, thank you very much. And uh,
Thank you, Ken. I appreciate it as well. We'll see you in two weeks on our next one. And you guys have a good and great evening, and uh, we'll talk to you in two weeks. Thank you, guys and gals. Thank you, Pat. Bye-bye now. See you guys. Thank you.